two, uh, Spanish 312 Hopscotch. And uh, it is a great pleasure today uh, to have Jerry Martin uh, uh, with me uh, to talk about Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, Jerry Martin is Professor Emeritus from uh, the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where he was for a long time. He um, has written uh, extensively on Latin American literature. He worked uh, uh, early on on a uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Miguel Angel Asturias. Um, but he, I suppose, is, is best known now for uh, this book, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, a, a Life, which is, um, as he puts it, I think, the not the authorized biography, but the tolerated biography of um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the Colombian Nobel Prize winner. Today, we will talk about Garcia Marquez, but especially about uh, this book, uh, 100 Years of Solitude, Cien Años de Soledad. And uh, Jerry, thank you so much uh, for for being here and for lending us your time and expertise. And A great pleasure. My first question is very open. Um, how would you suggest approaching this book for the first time? I've had a long history with this book because um, I first heard about the book um, three weeks before it came out. Um, in those days, one didn't know this was in the uh, late 1960s, and uh, news from Latin America came very slowly in those days, uh, and certainly not in our newspapers. So I heard about it three weeks before it uh, uh, came out, when I met Miguel Angel Asturias, who you just mentioned. And um, then I went to Mexico City a year later, didn't read the book before that, um, read it in Mexico City, wasn't out in translation. So that would have been 1968. I went back in 1969 to teach in Portsmouth, um, England. And uh, I was absolutely determined. I was completely bowled over. I was actually studying another man that was Asturias, but, and I don't think I wished that I could move to Garcia Marquez. But I did think, oh, my God, this is a fabulous book. This is such, I've never read anything like this in my life. And the only thing I can think of, the only thing I could think of at that time that I had read that was like it was Rabelais. I had read uh, Rabelais, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is Latin America. And it's sort of in its lack of control and its ability to do anything, and it's laughing at most things. This was very like Rabelais. So I went back and taught it to British students. Um, but before I taught it to the students, I had to work on it myself. And I had this unique experience because it's never happened to me before. It didn't even happen to me reading James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, I simply didn't know what to say. As, as, as I read the book, I didn't know what to say about it. I mean, I could come out with a lot of adjectives, but I didn't know what to say about how to enter the book or what the book was about. I could get no purchase. It seemed completely seamless, the book. Uh, there were no fault lines. There were no nooks and crannies. There were no interstices. There was no way of getting into that book I found back in 1969. And if you look for the next few years at the literary criticism back then, it, it is actually something really interesting. Um, you can see that most people didn't know anything. So what, what they came to saying was that uh, Garcia Marquez had found old ways of narrating. He was like some kind of gypsy, the gypsy in the novel maybe, who had ways of narrating, and these were magical, and your grandparents and your ancestors knew them, but we don't know them anymore, but he's found a way of putting it in the novel. But that didn't really help you to say what was in the book and how to go about it. And it took me a very long time. I've still got my notes from 1969. Um, they're hopeless. They, 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 they're no use. All they are is requoting the book. All they are is quotations from the book and me saying something about them, but they are not analyses of any kind about the book. And um, it took me a long time. And the way, in fact, in which uh, I now probably um, start. Uh, it took me years too. I shouldn't say that I solved the problem in '69 because I didn't. Um, and indeed, I wrote an article in 1987 when I was asked to. Uh, um, was it seven? No, it was earlier. Uh, I was asked to write about uh, Sinanios for a, 
British compendium and talked a bit about that and, 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 and how now the book completely different, and particularly after something like the Falklands War, uh, which was not long before I wrote this. And these days, the book seems so obvious to me, having lived through it and having rewritten my stuff loads of times. I mean, obvious in the sense that I can now say things about it. Um, that what I'd like to do is to do what I've done several times, but 99.9% .9 of people in the world, not excluding academics, think, which is that critical editions are boring. But I would like to sit down and do one of my critical editions that last me years. And because I still don't think that, um, I, I, I think there's still a lot to do on Sinanis de Soledad. But then my entire life is, is all these things I would have liked to do. Um, so what, what I would do is I would start with the first page. I would sit down. Um, and in fact, I do these days, except I haven't taught now for 20 years. But uh, when I say these days, I mean back in 2006, uh, when I left Pittsburgh. Um, what I did then was to sit the students down um, before they'd even read the book and ask them what the first page meant. To them. As they read down it, uh, what they thought was in it, what impact it made upon them. Um, did it strike them as different from anything they read before or not? What was the content? What might it mean? What on earth was that first sentence? Um, did that first sentence ever be uh, explained? Um, what did the book say about being a child? What did the book say about Latin America, apparently? Uh, what did it say about um, uh, um, being in the world? Um, all those different things. And... I found you can easily spend two hours doing that. So, so I actually know the answer to that question. May not be the best answer, but that, that's what I tended to do in the last years to reproduce in some way um, my experience going to the book in 1969, when I already knew much more about Latin America and Latin American literature than most of these students are likely to do, um, that you introduce a book like that to these days. Um, and just see how they reacted. And I, I have found that very productive. When you talk about the, that initial response or, or reaction to, to the book, it reminds me actually that the book anticipates so many of our responses and, and reactions. One of which, of course, it, it, it starts not in the first page, but in, in, in the first uh, uh, few pages or the first few dozen pages with this notion of a world in which uh, things just still don't have words, right? Yes. A, world, a world in which um, uh, people are still trying to figure out how to talk about things, how to uh, um, describe them, this moment of sort of wonder and, and surprise. And um, and perhaps that's, that's anticipating to some extent that, that reaction to the, to the book itself. It, it also reminds me a little of... Um, of course, the the final pages or the final words of uh, of the book, which are about the book being itself read and, and that reading as a sort of destruction. You know, there, there's nothing. There's nothing left, or there seems to be nothing left at, at, at the end. Um, I, I wonder. I mean, we could talk about the first the first line, the first three words, even. You know, muchos años después, uh, yes. many years later. Yes. Um, this this way in which. The novel plays with time, perhaps, right, and and makes you you're already anticipating from the start uh, what's going to happen several hundred pages in. Uh, Absolutely, time and and of course what goes with time for us, which is memory. Um, those are the two things that uh, that go to bed together. Yes, um, and as you say, uh, all of these things come flooding back. Then the book tells us they're all come flood they're all coming flood flooding back for the last Aureliano as well at the end of the book. Um, and that's the other thing the book manages to do so so well is to constantly mirror our own reading experience. In fact, you've just said exactly that really uh, about the first page. Uh, the book is constantly playing with the fact that we're reading the book um, and trying to make sense of it as the characters are trying to make sense of the world. And then on the last pages, one of the characters starts trying to make sense of this book, which is his world. Uh, it, it, it all seems so obvious when Garcia Marquez does it. Um, 
but uh, it, it, it's also brilliantly achieved. And when you think um, that he sat down and wrote this book um, in, um, in about a year, and when you think of his very Garcia Marquez way of doing it, uh, sitting in his house, writing this book, smoking 60 cigarettes a day, uh, ignoring his children, just like the characters in the book, nor their children, except he knows and feels bad about it. Um, and having his friends around every evening with a whiskey um, to read them each chapter of the book, uh, which I know is true because I've talked to all the people he did it with. Um, when you think of all of that, and then you think how well achieved the novel actually is, how, how absolutely extraordinary, it's almost like a clockwork toy, but then again, in the book, he says that literature is like a toy that people, you know, um, this is a very, very uh, uh, meta, but, but really in a very interesting and quite, quite lovable way, I would say, uh, sort of sort, sort of book. So, yes, um, the first page and the last, I mean, the last three pages are like some, to me, it sounds, I, I almost hear like the opening chords of some bolero as, as, as I start to read. And of course, he talks about music appearing, you know, uh, the music of uh, memory. I can't remember the wonderful quotation, um, which is a stereotype, but it's a, uh, a literary Latin American stereotype. And the last page is start and this bolero about the end of time and I'm abandoned. And, uh, uh, I'm getting quite enthused. I haven't actually read the book quite a time <laughs> and I haven't read anything I've written about it either. Um, but uh, yes. Um, I, 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 I don't the, think I've got. I don't think I've got to that one yet. But anyway, uh, ask me the next question. <laughs> well, I, I'm interested in sort of two aspects of, of of things you've said about the the book so far. One, this it's all like a clockwork toy; everything fits together. And at the same time, what sort of surprised me, but I understand <laughs> your comparison to Rabelais or the initial comparison to Rabelais, right? The the carnival, the world turns upside yes. down. Yes. Because both things are in the book. I mean, the book is the the book is kind of um, you know profuse and and overrun with uh, you know Aredianos, for instance, Jose Acadios. With you know, it's got so much in it in in a, in a sort of carnivalesque way, and yet it all fits together somehow at the same time. I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about that tension or compatibility of let's just say order and chaos in the book. Yes, if you if you uh, if you read the book and you're used to reading books, uh, you see that, that there's never one thing. Um, there's always a opposite, and so there is clockwork organization, which the book itself is unwinding. The it's unwinding its own literary clockwork, but there is clockwork, and at the same time there is this absolute joy in in in, in um, unraveling that in every given way that it can. Um, for example, the, the names, the repetitions, the endless stuff, which seems like clockwork, but turns out to be the opposite of it because it begins to gnaw away at structure and at organization and at tradition as it goes. And what I find even more um, miraculous about this is that, that there is in this book two kinds of three kinds of history of Latin America, I'm making them up now as I go along. The first is the real history of Latin America, and here's the Colombian example, um, a history of, um, and the stereotypes start almost as you begin, but I won't go in for those stereotypes. But here is Latin America since independence, um, uh, ending up in the 1960s with who knows what, another endless moment of disillusionment, or at last the great... Uh, revolutionary boom that transforms everything. And then we know he's talking about his friends, so he's talking about the literary boom. Um, so that's the first history, the, the history of Latin America itself, in terms of what historians see in novels. Then there's this, um, there's this extraordinary um, history in the book of, of ideas about Latin America, um, which, which I've talked about a bit. If you think of all the great um, pensadores, because uh, philosophers would be too much to say for most of them, but they are sort of philosophers, great pensadores. I mean, in this book are so many of the ideas about Latin America. Uh, 
Murener and the Pecado Original, the America Latina. Um, there's, uh, there's Martinez Estrada. Um, there's Ariel. All those ideas are they're written into the book without ever mentioning them or going into them. Um, there's, there's, there's that extraordinary world of Latin American stereotypes, which Latin Americans have imposed, and Garcia Marquez doesn't like it, which also uh, Europeans, of course, have imposed uh, about this absolutely hopeless continent. Whereas the the key concept um, about Latin America is actually Garcia Marquez's own, the theme Soledad, which again is is mentioned by so many pensadores, most famously uh, Octavio Paz, who of course hated this book, hated uh, Garcia Marquez's literature. I just thought it wasn't um, up to the standards of uh, serious uh, literature. Then Paz, Paz couldn't know everything, could he? Uh, Garcia Marquez is very interested in the whole question of the periphery, um, of Latin America as the unknown continent, uh, Latin America as a place where everything was beginning again because nobody ever knew it had already happened and then been forgotten again because it's not inscribed in history, uh, etc. Um, so there's that history. And then there's the various histories uh, which we see in the book itself, which are a kind of, um, of case study of all these different things. So I myself think that, that it is what, what when we're talking about these tensions um, and, and paradoxes, um, and I haven't, re haven't read a now I come to think about it, I haven't read a book on paradox in, in um, Sinanus to Solid, though there must be one, but I haven't read one. But um, there is this incredible paradox of what appears to be a lucid, I always use the word diaphanous because he does, uh, this, this, this radiant narrative, even when it's somber uh, in a way, it's also radiant because that's what he's doing. Um, which therefore gives you a sense of emptiness. Uh, the solitude of Latin America is also a sort of vacuum. Uh, the, the, it, it never gets filled up. Uh, nothing ever gets achieved. It's, it's, it's always still empty in terms of historical record. Um, and yet I myself believe, um, you even arrogantly claim to know, the book is absolutely full of stuff. I mean, it's just full. Most of the references are multiple, uh, not just singular. Uh, the book is absolutely full of references, and it's absolutely a miracle that he managed to weave all of them together into these 20 chapters that are not chapters because they don't have numbers or titles, you know, but there they are, uh, and they're all about almost exactly the same length, you know, um, 20 chapters, which are just spaces, but which do um, fit together to produce this um, very clear and in some ways ridiculously coherent. Um, I mean, if you just sit down and work out how the chapters fit together, um, and, and I've tried to show in one thing I wrote that they are nine, nine and two, and I'm quite sure this is correct. Um, and if you then work out the way the history gradually becomes known and that it, the book is in one way obvious, um, but it's not obvious at all because we don't even know what the ending means. We don't know that. It feels as if we know when we when we read it, um, but actually, if you sit down, uh, ten academics and say, and is the ending? Numbers of people have written the straightforward thing: is is this an optimist, politically optimistic, or pessimistic book? Uh, mm -hmm. You will find academics split down the middle about that. Um, and then, of course, regardless of what Garcia Marquez thought about it, um, could he write it today uh, with the same kind of and so on? You know. Um, sorry, I'm not being uh, as coherent as even I would uh, like to be, but uh, anyway. No, no, this is, this is all great and, and, and fascinating and very helpful. I, I wonder if to that question about um, optimism or pessimism and the different kinds of history uh, that you've outlined, if perhaps another paradox, or I don't know what, if, it, if it's a paradox, is that in some ways the book itself contradicts its own narrative in this sense you know if 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 the history of latin america that it it tells as you say is a history of of no one ever learning from their mistakes apparently is a history of a sort of history of futility a history of of, of solitude which seems to end in this apocalypse with these sort of scars of the violence and modernity and the the banana plantation massacre and so on 
the success of the book itself shows that something does get produced in and from Latin America. And I know one of the arguments that, that you've made that you make in um in in this book, in, in the biography, but also you make in a, a survey, I think Journeys Through the, uh, the Labyrinth, is that in some ways with this book, let's say the global south announces itself on, on the world stage. The global uh, the south announces itself as a cultural force or, or presence, particularly Latin America, but you but you make the the, the broader claim for, for for the South, <clears throat> and that this is, you know, the, the the confidence and the ambition of this book, perhaps, um, contradicts or contrasts with, with with some of the pessimistic aspects of what it's actually telling us. You, uh, you, you're asking wonderful questions, actually. And um, I, <laughs> as you said that, um, I thought exactly um, how, in my own case, ironic it is uh, that in, for example, uh, Journeys Through the Labyrinth, um, I, um, but then Journeys Through the Labyrinth, you know, I mean, I wrote a book, but, but, but um, you know, this is 33 years ago. Let me, yes, 33 years ago. Um, that until this last week, <laughs> I haven't even bothered to get translated into Spanish. I never bothered. People say, but why didn't you bother? And I say, well, the book exists, you know, someone else could do it or whatever, or books, you know, Garcia Marcus said they're like lions, you just forget about the dead lions, you know, blah, blah. Um, but the ironic thing that I was going to say is that I, as a Latin Americanist, I, I came to Latin America when well, I came when I was 15, actually. And um, when, no, I came before that when I collected stamps, but I particularly came when I was 15 and Cuba happened. Um, so I was sort of a Latin Americanist since then. It was where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. Didn't know if I could. But I came to Latin American studies in the 60s. Um, when, in a way, it really was invented post-Cuba, and there was various things in Britain, the Parry Report, and in the States, they were worried about how to neutralize Cuba, and so on. Um, and I realized that even still, by the time of journeys, um, I believe the Garcia Marquez spiel, because I, I do actually think that one of the dimensions, and I think you just, again, implicitly pointed to it, is that he was saying, here we are. The others couldn't see, our forefathers couldn't see, but we can. Now we see. Um, this is a moment of consciousness. What's dying is the whole of the past. Those future generations, which we may love, but they were deluded, they didn't know the way to do it. Now we, I mean, what I see, um, it's not the first time I've seen it at all, but I would say actually that in this conversation, the first time I've seen so clearly, is that not only were they deluded, um, but that I hadn't clearly seen the way in which they were deluded and the way in which I myself was deluded, which is they hadn't so much seen their own arrival on the uh, global um, scene as they'd come to see the global scene that we all saw um, from then, um, because although you can argue when global, like when when was modernity? You know when does that begin? Um, you know when contemporaneity is because that's an easy one to work out. But when did modernity begin? Uh, and you can go back. Uh, you can start with the Renaissance and so on. Uh, University of Oxford would have a different view on this to most, etc. Um, but um, globalization moment when we mostly knew globalization was certainly the 1960s. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, that's when the world we live in precisely today was created. Um, and I think those of us who thought that Latin America had arrived and would stay now look really rather ridiculous because even in the period of globalization um, and even with the staggering things that have happened since 1989 to now, uh, where you know things have happened that we would never have thought would have happened, uh, including oligarchs going alone to uh, wherever they're going to go, all those things, um, 
Latin America has actually got a bit lost again. It really still mm -hmm. has to have its latest, especially leftist revolution in order to really, or Bolsonaro has to cut down half of the Amazon jungle or whatever um, for Latin America to really get its equal place in. So I think the ironies are absolutely multiple. But I also think that Garcia Marquez being um, not as revolutionary crazy as people always assert that he was, he was actually a very, very prudent and cautious person. And um, if I were to flick through the book now, I could find uh, five or six places where he gets his uh, excuses in, in case it's not quite such a basis for euphoria uh, as the book appears to be uh, suggesting. He was, after all, behind all that we're talking about in terms of the history of Latin America and whether it's turned out well or not, and behind all that he's talking about in terms of possible worker revolutions, worker peasant revolutions or whatever, there is a, there is a stoical, skeptical person um, who gives a lot of the tone of the book. And so underneath all these things we're talking about, there is uh, what could be called, or what we could have called in the old days, an infrastructure. Um, but that infrastructure is a kind of uh, very profound philosophical um, skepticism, I think, um, which we have to understand. And I have wondered because um, one of the many theories that I put forward that not a single person has ever <laughs> addressed, which is what happens to us if we're literary critics. Um, you know, we feel as if we're part of this great ongoing debate, but most of the time people are not necessarily reading the books. We, even the people mm -hmm. who should be are not reading the books that you write. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I have actually identified that all of Garcia Marcus's books, with one or two exceptions, are carefully organised must be uh, conscious. In fact, in some, it, it must really be conscious because you can see where the join is. In two exact halves, they're all like that. And um, I never got round. I thought, after you've done this, you're going to sit down and work out exactly what this is about and where it goes to. But of course, I never have. Uh, but one of the things I sometimes think when I'm on a train or in bed or whatever is that that is simply coming up to... Um, uh, the very uh, uh, prime of life, which would be more or less what you're in, I would think, uh, <laughs> John. <laughs> and you get up there, and uh, then you get your midlife crisis, and then you go down again. And uh, this, there's an apex, and then there's an... And I've got a strong feeling that in Garcia Marquez, who is so concerned with time and so concerned with generations, um, that they're so important to him, and he watched so many of his family who were important to him reach old age and die. Um, but it, it, it may be connected to that in some way. But anyway, there is this infrastructure that, that I just mentioned. So we're, we're basically out of time, but I do want to ask you one more question. And, it, and the, I think your answer is sort of implicit in, in, in some of the things uh, you've said, um, which is in that you spent a lot of time with Cien Años, you spent a lot of time with we're writing the biography of, of of Garcia Marquez, but I know that you've also spent quite a lot of time. You did spend quite a lot of time with Garcia Marquez himself and, mm -hmm. and knew him. And I wondered, just briefly, I'm sure you could you could you could tell us a, a, a lot, but I wondered what ways you saw the book differently, having got to know the 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 person of of Garcia Marquez, or it, it, or perhaps not. Were there ways in which some aspect, some seen some element of the book uh, uh, seem different yes. because of uh, yes. knowing him? For a start, um, the book, I mean, this is so often the case. Um, perhaps it's so often that it's not interesting, but I think it is because it's always different, um, which is the book is, is, is um, let me say two things. He never wanted to talk about the book. It is absolutely true. You can read this in the press and so on. Garcia Marcus has never wanted to talk about that book. Um, and it's clearly to do with superstition because he was actually a very superstitious person. To what extent that was a game or not? I mean, even I uh, did something very important last Friday the 13th. He was slightly anxious that it could go awry uh, for that. But then I'm probably much more superstitious since I've known him. Um, 
But the book is a straightforward autobiography um, in a way. Um, I had the incredible privilege of, of going on a very Garcia Marquez adventure with his brothers um, who were all like the characters in the book. Um, I don't wish to, uh, I don't wish to, uh, you know, caricature them, um, but they even loved, they, they took no notice of the book, so they weren't doing it to be like the book, far from it. They'd have, uh, they'd have just laughed at Gavito and had another whiskey, you know, but I was picked up by one of them in Cartagena. He was going back to Venezuela where he lived. Um, uh, that was Gustavo. He took me on to Barranquilla where we picked up Luis Enrique, who would be something like um, the um, younger Jose Arcadio in, in, in Cien Años. Uh, there's so many biographical things in there. That it's unmistakable if you know the family. Then with Luis Enrique, we went off to um, uh, San, uh, Santa Marta where Jaime was. Then we went off across the Guajira and stopped at various places. We were drinking ourselves silly and, and um, the mixture of uh, aguardiente, uh, which you mentioned in your, I don't know if it's in your lecture now or if you've cleaned, cleaned up your act. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the mixture of aguardiente and old par whiskey was just uh, horrifying. And we were also, uh, well, no, I won't even go into that. Um, and we stopped at the rancheria where the indigenous members of the Garcia Marquez family were to be found in the middle. So none of that stuff is, I, I lived it. But the behavior of these guys and, 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 and the sheer joyous irresponsibility of everything they were doing, and most of them were by then in their late sixties or seventies, was just something that is in the book. So. He's found a way of putting his family life in the book, but stepping back and turning in, 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 into something else. So two things. A, you would have thought that he would want to sit and just boast gently, indirectly, about this most famous book of his, but he didn't want to talk about it at all, and he never referred to it, ever, ever. And I learned not to do it because um, one thing you didn't do was engage uh, Gabo in a conversation he didn't want. Uh, that was a mistake. And it was also a mistake to be too assertive, say how his book should be understood. This was a catastrophic mistake because he didn't like academics. And um, you shouldn't ask him too many leading questions. But above all, don't talk about Cien Años. He was happy talking about any other novel that he ever wrote, not that one. So that's very strange, but interesting. Um, and I could come out with some uh, Freudian explanations for it, and, and some of them are absolutely obvious to do with childhood, to do with humiliation, to do with error, to do with being abandoned by your parents, a whole range of different things. Um, but also the incredible superstition. Um, at the end of the book, he, he does talk about, and he dared to do it, but, but, but hardly did this kind of thing. He talks about the, the three great friends he had in Barranquilla. Um, and says what's going to happen to them and, and does predict their deaths in exactly the correct order. Um, he was always doing things like this. Uh, I was glad he didn't do it to me because there was a psychic person in Garcia Marquez uh, who knew a lot of things. Uh, I don't want to get, uh, you know, uh, extra sensory, et cetera, but it was. So he did predict exactly um, the order in which those friends would die. And... Um, there's a lot of other stuff in the book that is clearly important to him in ways that I cannot access. Um, but at the same time, I mean, for example, Amaranta is quite straightforwardly, if you know her, uh, she's his, uh, you her, she died a couple of years ago. It's his, it's his sister Margot, um, right down to details like eating earth and being incredibly difficult to get to deal with and how men could never understand her and, 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 and get across her. They just could not. Um, he is clearly Aureliano, right down to Aureliano on the first day, opening his eyes and looking around the room. Uh, this is famous in the family that, uh, that Gabba did. That, but it's not just that. It's, it's his shame at being like he is, which comes out much more strongly in the autumn of the patriarch, his ambition, his desire to win. Fact that he's not the amiable guy, that he's all Caribbean guy, that he's etc. Um, 
So the book is, in a very real way, especially the first hundred pages or so, is a book about his childhood, his family, and so on. The first generation of people who were actually born in the book, I guess about his people. Uh, later on, um, he imagines what future generations might be like, and he puts himself and the family back 30 or 40 years earlier than they would have been, but it, it's the history. So those two things, um, I think, uh, are, are, are what first comes to mind. I mean, I, I could actually talk about this for days. Um, it was it's an incredible experience, but also very difficult in a way, because um, once you met the man, um, it, it kind of gets in the way of the book. Uh, you don't have to do it in a biographical way, but it's very difficult for you to stop. Well, it would be fascinating uh, to talk for days, but we we are out of time, a little over time, if anything. But this has been uh, fantastic, uh, Jerry. Thanks so much for sharing your time and your expertise on on the book on, on Garcia Marquez and uh, and and yes, so many stories uh, you must also have about the man. And I quite understand how that may sometimes get in the way of of, of reading the book. But this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much, Jerry. I've enjoyed it very much. See you, John.